Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, this seminar in the Peking University School of Transnational Law, Beijing Dajie Guoji Fashui Yuan Law and Humanities Seminar Series. Uh, Peking University School of Transnational Law, for those of you who may not know, is part of the Peking University Shenzhen Graduate School, Beijing Dajie Guoji, excuse me, Beijing Dajie Shenzhen Yuan Zhou Yuan. Uh, my name is Norman Ho. I teach uh, at uh, the Peking University School of Transnational Law, and I would like to thank you all for uh, coming uh, to this seminar today. Uh, we're very honored um, uh, to have with us as our uh, speaker today, Professor Michael Dowdle, who is an associate professor at the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. Uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, Professor Dowdle. Uh, as I mentioned, he teaches at the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law and writes uh, in the areas of legal theory, transnational law, uh, regulatory geography. And he also uh, has had a lot of experience uh, in China as well and in researching Chinese law. He previously served as visiting chair in globalization and governance at and I apologize for the French speakers in the audience because I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. Uh, Sciences Po in Paris and has served as a research fellow at Australian National University and the Center for Chinese Legal Studies at Columbia Law School and has also taught at NYU School of Law, the University of Washington School of Law and the Center for Transnational Legal Studies in London. Uh, Mike is also a friend and uh, just two uh, other fun facts about Professor Dowdle. Uh, he's not only extremely talented uh, in legal research, but uh, in his prior life before becoming a legal academic, I, I, I remember that Professor Dowdle was a composer. Uh, and if you ever meet him in person, uh, he makes a very a good fondue. So uh, if you ever get a, a chance um, to meet him. And Professor Dowdle uh, will talk about his new book, uh, which came out uh, with Cambridge University Press uh, this autumn, entitled Transnational Law, a Framework for Analysis. Uh, let me, before we begin, let me just uh, uh, share with everyone the format of today's seminar. Uh, first of all, this seminar is being recorded, uh, although we will not record the Q&A question and answers and discussion at the end. Uh, the second point, just to let everybody know, is that the first part of the seminar will be basically a moderated conversation and interview between me and Professor Dowdle. Uh, and I'll ask him some questions about his new book and we'll have a conversation. Uh, that will be for about 35 to 40 minutes uh, so that everybody can understand sort of the major themes in Professor Dowdle's book. And then uh, we will open the floor to discussion and questions and answers. And so that will be the uh, format for today. Okay. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Dowdle, welcome. Thank you for doing this. And I guess the first question I'll ask you is your book, Transnational Law of Framework for Analysis. Uh, we can just start uh, really uh, with the title, um, uh, Transnational Law. Uh, obviously, these are key words in your book title. Uh, if you could explain to us maybe uh, I guess, start off why you wrote this book and then maybe explain what you mean by transnational law or how we should understand the concept of transnational law. Okay. Um, first, the title wasn't my first choice, but it was the first choice of my editors. So they use transnational law because it's a, it's a common term. So if it would have been me, I would have probably called it transnational regulation. But they thought transnational law would just resonate more with people. Um, so how did I come to write the book? I was seconded to the Center for Transnational Legal Studies in 2014, and they asked me to teach the core course on transnational law, and I agreed. Um, I never even thought about transnational law by then, and I had about two months to prepare, and I prepared a fairly detailed syllabus, about 150 works in it. Um, I uh, had a co-director, a uh, co-teacher as well, and we caught, taught the course and it went pretty well. I enjoyed it and I really enjoyed working with my co-teacher. Uh, co so after I said, I don't want to 
I don't want all this stuff to go to waste. So I talked to my co-teacher was Chantel Mack. Um, for those of you who looked at the book um, on Cambridge's site, you'll see her mentioned in the um, in the acknowledgments. And so I said, you know, we should we've done all this work. We have 150 articles and, or 150 articles and we have another 60 more sitting on the side. We should do a textbook. It shouldn't take that long. And she agreed. Um, I just wanted to do it because I thought, like I said, it was fun teaching with her. I thought it'd be fun working with her and it was fun in the course. And so I thought it'd be something easy to do and something rather enjoyable. Um, I told this to a colleague of mine uh, and then the colleague of mine mentioned this to William Twining, who was, in addition to being uh, one of the germinal legal theorists of general jurisprudence, um, was also head of the Law and Context series at Cambridge University Press. And out of nowhere, I got an email from William Twining, um, <laughs> kind of shocked me, uh, asking if, saying, I hear you're gonna write a book on transnational law, would you, consider publishing it with our series. Now, you don't say no to William Twining, um, which I probably should have, because then it took me six years to write the book. Um, but finally, I got it out. And for those of you out there, if I can write a book, you can write a book. But it took a long time. Uh, and that's basically how it got to be written. I think, was there a second part to the question? Yep. Oh, the title, so, what is transnational and, law? Yep. So what is, uh, I guess uh, the next question would be uh, getting into uh, the themes of the book. I, uh, what is transnational law um, and why and how should we uh, study it? Yes. Okay. Um, again, for the purposes of this book, transnational law is, Twining would call it a field concept. Um, um, Wittgenstein would call it family resemblances. It's something, it's a term that's quite frequently used. Um, whether there's a, def a definition or a denotative definition to it, that wasn't the point. It's, it's something that people recognize. Um, I think of it as, it's a term, it's a hollow term. It describes what it isn't more than what it is. So traditionally, again, to quote Twining, um, study of law has focused on what Twining calls the Westphalian duo. And this is on the one side, domestic state law, and on the other side, public international law. Domestic state law is the law that governs a particular state territory. Public international law governs the relationship between states. One way, and this is the way I define it, transnational law is neither one of these. It is, it's, it's not constrained to a particular territory but it doesn't govern state to state relations. It governs state to citizen relations or citizen to ci citizen relations. International arbitration is transnational law because it's governing relations between private corporations from different countries. Um, uh, the UN Global Compact, corporate social responsibility is um, transnational law because it's governing the relationship between a supranational organization, the UN, and a number of local and I mean transnational corporations, local populations. Um, I'm trying to think of their, um, so that that's it. I'm trying to think of some um, state sanctioning regimes or called smart sanctions are also transnational law. They're implemented by states, so they're domestic legislation, but they are imposed or trans, um, but they are imposed on foreign actors or extraterritoriality. When the United States asserts its antitrust legislation against a company from Australia because of some restraint of trade that affects the United States claims affects American citizens, that's transnational law because it's a state again, it's a state citizen um, relationship rather than a state state relationship. But beyond that, um, that's basically it. Again, it's a term of art. Um, people will always ask me, what do I mean by it? But then when you organize a seminar, you're saying Dowdle speaking on transnational law, and then you have all these people come before I even get to explain it. 
So it is something that resonates with people. Um, it's just a broad category. And some of it, like I include human rights and transnational law because that governs state to human relationships, even though most people is frequently included within public international law. I don't worry that much on drawing boundaries. I'm really interested in the um, implications of this particular type of relationship, legal relationship. And uh, how, so how, this book, of course, um, one function of it, as you had mentioned, is uh, it serves as a textbook for people who are studying transnational law. So how mm -hmm. how should we uh, study uh, transnational law? Um, or how does the book uh, set forth that? The book provides a framework for analysis. It doesn't provide a framework for study. Sorry to get a little bit teacher teacher like on, uh, but everyone studies in their own way. This provides a way of thinking about transnational law, um, questions to ask, and some of the implications that arise from certain decisions by transnational regimes about how to organize themselves. So it's really a framework for analysis, it's not a framework for study. Um, it's useful, I think, for students, but it's also useful for policymakers. I think it's useful for academics. I've gotten a lot of positive responses from law professors about the book, not because they want to use it for students, but because they, this is, as far as I know, um, this is the first really um, comprehensive conceptual organization of how the transnational affects a particular regulatory regime. Um, and this is a way to think about it, to analyze it, a way to get into it as a student, as a practitioner, as a policymaker, as a transnational actor. So as you so mentioned- I don't know the, if that answers your question. Yep. Um, so it's- it, it, A confession and avoidance. Well, it's a good segue because uh, I was mm. going to ask next. Mm. So the, the book does mm. provide indeed a conceptual framework mm. for approaching, mm. analyzing, and working with transnational mm. legal phenomena. So I was wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit more now about mm. uh, maybe give some examples or uh, mm -hmm. Tell us uh, specifically what uh, conceptual frameworks uh, uh, the book provides, uh, and maybe uh, if you have some examples or case studies to illustrate that in action. The book is 700 pages, so it's got a lot of case studies. Um, in developing the course that I mentioned at CTLS, one of the things that I found frustrated is that you can find a lot of discussion about particular transnational regimes. And then you can find this kind of philosophical um, uh, jurisprudence discussion of transnational law generally. But you don't really see a structural or a functional investigation, as I mentioned before, about how transnational, how the transnational, how working within a transnational environment affects law, affects the practice of law, affects the structure of law. There are unique problems that deal with the transnational and transnational regulatory regimes have to respond to those problems. Um, and, the, and those responses are complicated. So what the first thing the book does is the book divides itself into various functions of transnational law. So we start out by uh, what I call legitimation. Legitimation is every transnational regulatory regime has to have a reason for existence. It has to legitimate itself. This distinguishes it from a domestic regulatory regime. Domestic regulatory regimes are innately legitimated to the extent they arise out of a legislative process, which is legitimated by a constitution, which everyone feels is legitimate. So for uh, the Food and Drug Association of the United States, there's no need to legitimate it. But for international investment arbitration, there is a legitimacy issue. Um, why do we need this? Uh, why do we need you doing it? So this is one of the things that's distinctive about transnational law is that they have to legitimate themselves. They have to devote energy and intellectual energy to, to explaining this is why I exist. And there are a number of basic, different bases by which they can legitimate themselves. They can make a, to quote Margaret Thatcher, uh, there is no alternative. 
this is the way the world is. We need some way to govern. It's always going to be this way. We need to govern it. So we need to govern. Or um, you can have technocratic legitimation. We know about competition law better than anybody else. And therefore, we're going to show you or help you see how to do competition law. There's cosmopolitanism. We're all human beings together. We all have the same needs. We all have the same experiences. Um, let's collaborate. Let, let's gather together our different understandings and create a better a better world, or at least a better understanding of the world or of our problems. You can have um, professionalization. Uh, we're all competition regulators. We need to learn from each other. We need to cooperate because we're getting in each other's way. Um, emancipation. These are all, um, you have a transnational legal framework. It allows you to escape um, oppressive domestic practices. Um, so all these are different types of legitimation. Generally, we can distinguish between two types of legitimation. This becomes important further on. One type, let's call it, is technocratic. Um, our legitimacy comes from the fact that we are experts in this field and we know what we're doing. Um, and therefore you don't have to worry about it. Um, and another is, I don't use this term in the book, but political scientists will recognize this, regulatory. Here's a group of integrated, um, um, bound together populations, but they all have different interests. They all have different um, needs. And the purpose of the transnational regime is to combine these people into a collective to balance their different needs and different interests, sometimes giving them what they want, sometimes giving someone else what they want, but keeping them together so they can coordinate and get rid of externalities and other types of problems that come when we just all enter a Hobbesian state of nature. So these are the two types of broad legitimation devices. Now, what the next chapter then looks at regulatory function. It looks at the basic things, some of the basic things that break transnational regulatory institutions do. So one is rulemaking. One is dispute resolution. Then you have development. There's a significant um, focus on uh, international law looking at economic and legal development. Uh, humanitarian uh, aid is another one. I'm forgetting one. Uh, just deliberation. Sometimes there's um, deliberation. and There's another one that I'm forgetting now. Now, what's interesting is that you see the same sort of divide Arise, so I mentioned before the technocratic versus the regulatory. You see this same, how you choose with regards to legitimation affects how you do your, your function. So let's take dispute resolution. Generally, dispute resolution has been in the form of um, arbitration. Now, arbitration is a technocratic practice. Um, and arbitrators are some of the most insulated um, intellectual actors in the legal profession universe. They don't talk to, they only talk to each other. Um, but, and that's a very technocratic way. So they, they have legitimating decision, make a uh, uh, dispute resolution results in a technocratic form of um, um, dispute resolution, which is arbitration. But I should say the legitimating is often contested. So you might have an international regime and some people will say, no, this is a technocratic regime. We know what we're doing. Uh, development, uh, uh, develop, uh, international development program. This is a big issue now. Yeah, we, we know development, we know what we're doing. And then someone else says, no, 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 that's not the point. You have to listen to the, you have to take other people's considerations into account. Um, and that's the regulatory part or what I could call the interest balancing part. Now let's look at arbitration. What's interesting is that for, up until the 1990s, up until the 21st century, transnational dispute resolution was arbitration. And that was very technocratic, but there was a lot of dissatisfaction with that. And so what you see beginning around 2005, maybe 2010, is the really dramatic rise of an alternative form of dispute resolution called medi mediation, which is not technocratic, um, and is more in the form of regulatory. So you're really balancing interests there. You're not saying somebody wins, somebody loses. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. So you see the same, th and same thing with uh, law and development or developmental theory. It used to be very technocratic, but now you're getting a lot more discussion about 
well, we need to really balance interests here. It just can't be experts coming us and telling how to set up a, uh, a competition law. Um, there are different interests here and, and we have to listen to these interests and it has to be a dialogue. And what you find is that through all these functions um, that I explore, you see them dividing up this way. Um, you see it in humanitarian aid, used to be just the Red Cross. We go in, we give aid, we don't care about whether the regime is legitimate or not, we're just trying to help the citizens. And then more recently, there's a lot of humanitarian actors say, no, we have to care about what's happening to our, our aid. Is this propping up a, 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 a bad regime? Um, so you have that. The next, sec the next chapter looks at governance. Same thing in governance. Um, you have a technocratic form of governance, which follow uh, Diane, Kohei and I call the, they call it the club model. This is a small group of people, like-minded people who control the regime. Um, and then you have what's called multilateral or multi-shareholder models, um, which is where you have a regime which there's a lot of input from a lot of diverse interests. Now, the choice of legitimation, the choice of how you're going to, to, to legitimate what type of um, how you're gonna shape your particular regulatory activities. This also implicates governance. And, um, and so you have the same, it's the same thing. I mean, the, the club model is a technocratic form of governance. The multilateral is a much more interest balancing governance. Now here you have to start paying attention to how these factors interrelate because sometimes it doesn't, they, they, they don't get it right. An example of this would be the OECD. The OECD is set up as a technocratic organization to help lesser developed countries um, um, learn how to develop. Um, it was dominated, it was uh, monopolized basically by advanced industrial democracies of the North Atlantic. And so it was originally formed as a club model, but there was a lot of disagreement and a lot of criticism about this, that it was, um, as time went on, it, it was too Western. Um, it was too elitist. So the OECD began to try to portray itself and reshape itself into a more inclusive environment. Japan was invited uh, to be a member um, and they tried to institute dialogue with developing countries, but it never shifted out of the club model governance. And this really hurt its efforts to diversify. So Japan, even though it was formally invited as a member, had no say. It, it was not the say of France or Germany, or the United States. Yeah, they were formally a member, but they were Asian, so they didn't have. So they tried to change the way they did their job, the way they did their function, but they didn't change the governmental system. And so this is one of the things I'm exploring, how one of these facets affects the other facets and what happens, um, how to explain why some facet doesn't work. And so in the OECD model, you see this even now, this kind of stagnation. They're trying to be open, they're trying to show themselves as um, being inclusive, but their governance structure isn't. And so that transition has not been particularly effective. Um, after that, I look at enforcement. Now enforcement is the big bugbear of transnational law. I have a colleague, very well known, James Penner, who says transnational law isn't law. Um, in the same way that Hart, uh, HLA Hart said that inter uh, public international law isn't law for the same reason, there isn't any enforcement. It can't be law if there is enforcement. Um, I use, a, in analyzing this question, um, I use a particular framework that was developed by the legal sociologist, John Braithwaite at ANU, what he calls the regulatory pyramid. And he develops this in the context of the domestic legal system. And he says, there's always a standard process for enforcement in domestic legal systems. You start out with the least punitive, negotiation, discussion, teaching, a cooperative form of encouragement to align your behavior with those of the regulators. After that, the next level is some sort of disincentive. Okay, you're gonna keep acting like a jerk, sorry. Um, it's late at night. Um, you keep acting like a jerk. We're going to impose some sort of sanction. We're going to impose some sort of penalty on you. 
we're going to make your life a little bit more different. It might be a fine. It might be, as in the case of um, uh, administrative guidance in Japan, it might be removal from particular opportunities. If that doesn't work, then you go to the highest tier, which is incapacitation. Okay, we're sending you to jail. We're, we're closing down your business or we're forcing you to sell. This is in domestic regulation, but what I found out is that you can see the same sort of dynamic happening in transnational law. Generally, when you have a problem of non-compliance in most transnational regimes, the first stage is just to talk with them, to say, look, this isn't working. Um, why aren't you doing it this way? What, what, what's the problem? Um, so that, that's always the first stage. Uh, second stage, you'll get, um, you get a little bit more punitive. Generally, the punitive me measures are naming and shaming. Um, and there's actually naming and um, uh, an opposite to naming and shaming, which is sort of naming and celebrating. Um, but that'd be the next. Naming and shaming is the pr principal way. Or you might put a, a transnational actor on probation. And then the, the final stage is incapacitation. You kick the person out. You, you kick the entity out of the regulatory system. You deny them the benefits of being a part of the regulatory pro of that regulatory arena. That works fairly well when we're dealing with types of regulation which are encouraging cooperation that, that, that give you access to markets or to um, uh, particular communities. It doesn't work so well when you're dealing with um, what I've called regulation or, or interest balancing. But it's still that so you, you find it so I. My argument is there is a rate, there is enforcement there. It's the same enforcement pattern that you see in states as, uh, or in domestic systems as described by Braithwaite. It's a pyramidic structure. You start with cooperative enforcement and then you move to more punitive forms of enforcement. Um, next, I look at states as transnational entities. I mentioned before, um, states also, when, when you have a state dealing with a, um, a private party from another state that's transnational. Um, examples of this include extraterritoriality, um, sanctioning, uh, what are called intergovernmental networks, a number of these. And I look at, I'm not going to go through that right now. Next chapter looks at legal pluralism. Uh, and the same thing, yeah, I mean, in legal pluralism, this is where, because we're dealing with transnational regimes and because they're not spatially bounded. It's very easy for two transnational legal regimes to intersect one another. So you'll have a particular party or a particular group of parties that are subject to two internet transnational regulatory regimes. What happens if these two regimes issue conflicting directives? That's legal pluralism. You can't do both. How do you decide which one to do? And then the regimes have to decide when we disagree with a particular regulatory framework, how should we resolve this as well? And there are a number of ways, I go through a, a lot of ways in which regimes do this. Generally, we can distinguish between what are called internal legal pluralism. This is choice of law. Okay, regime A says X, regime Y says, well, regime A says one, X, regime B says Y, will, submitted to a, a juridified dispute resolution mechanism, like choice of law. Um, and then there's um, what's called external legal pluralism. This is where there is no legalized dispute resolution. It has to be done political, politically. Uh, examples of this, uh, you see it in the EU with regards to, um, um, uh, sorry, I'm losing my um, margin of appreciation would be an example of that. Um, and then you can also just have a situation where there's a conflict and both sides ignore each other. Mutual indifference is what Koibner calls it. Um, and again, this has implications because some of these are more technocratic ways of dealing with um, regime disputes. And these work in the case of technocratic regimes. Some are more political. These work are, are more suited for um, regulatory regimes. Uh, and then there'll be contestation uh, there as well. Final chapter looks at transnationalization in the context of the legal profession and how transnationalization is changing the legal profession. Uh, and then 
I look at it first with regards to the structure of law firms, um, the emergence of new forms of legal professions, particularly in the global south, legal process outsourcing, for example. Um, and then I also look at it in the context of transnational ethics. And there's a big debate about whether there should be a code of transnational ethics. In fact, transnational legal ethics. In fact, there are two, one American, one European, or whether we should handle these ethical considerations in a different way, or whether they're given the nature, and this is part of, given the nature of the transnational, um, and given the fact that most transnational private actors are going to be elites. Um, they're going to be big firms. They're going to be powerful lawyers. They're going to be lawyers representing their firms. One person says there's not really that much problem with ethical considerations in this regard because everyone's on the same page. There's no incentive for a lawyer to behave um, unethically because he has or she has the same interests as her um, client and the same interests as the regulatory regulating body, at least insofar as transnational economic regulation is concerned. Anyway, so that's an overview. And then, like I said, all of these are connected. So that's the framework for analysis. Looking at what, how, looking at the particular function a regulatory regime adopts tells you also something about its mode of governance. Uh, looking at the mode of governance tells you about what it can and cannot do as a regulator. Looking about its legitimacy, tells you something about what it can and cannot do. And all of these are contested. And the con contestation tells you something about how that regulatory system is fitting within or interacting with um, the larger transnational environment. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Dowdle, for that uh, comprehensive overview of the book and then the framework and the uh, interplay uh, between the various functions. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to open the floor now to uh, questions and answers and open discussion. Uh, and as I mentioned first, uh, we will uh, stop the recording here. Uh, so this part will not be recorded. Okay. So let me just...